Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Uh, we're a think tank based at Concordia University, working at the intersection of human rights, conflict, and emerging technologies. And we're extremely pleased today to have you join us for an important discussion uh, on breaking down online hate and violence against women. Uh, as we've seen uh, across the world, increasingly online space has been a hostile place for women, uh, particularly politicians and journalists. Uh, we've seen uh, non-ending harassment and, and increasing amounts of women that are, are, are pulling back from public life because of this violence and this online misogyny. So uh, we're ho hosting this event today as part of the Digital Peace Project. It's an initiative funded by the government of Canada, by, by Canadian Heritage, to really look at how online hate uh, targeting different groups in Canada is taking place and we're bringing in different experts from Canada and internationally to talk about this problem and find solutions. How can we uh, build better public policies? How can we hold social media companies to account to deal with online hate? And today we're, we're, we're really going to talk about uh, how it affects women in particular because it is a different kind of hate and one that, um, that I think we really need to understand more. Um, we're really happy today uh, to have as our partner the National Council of Women of Canada for sponsoring this event and being and broadcasting it to the members. So thank you for that. And with uh, further ado, I would like to uh, pass the floor to my colleague Lauren Salim, the project leader for the Digital Peace Project, to introduce our moderator and our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks everyone for being with us today. I'm um, just going to very quickly take a moment to introduce the moderator and the speakers. These are very brief versions of their bio. I won't do it justice, but um, we are so excited to have Catherine McKenna with us today to moderate for the next hour. Catherine is the founder and principal of Climate and Nature Solutions. She's the chair of the UN Secretary General's new high-level expert group on net zero commitments of non-state entities. She's also a distinguished visiting fellow at Columbia's Climate School and their Center on Global Energy Policy and recently launched Women Leading on Climate at COP26. She's also Canada's former Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, for our speakers, first up, we've got Lucina DiMecco. Uh, she's a gender equality expert and women's rights advocate, recognized by Apolitical as one of the 100 most influential people in gender policy for her work on gender disinformation. She's the co-founder of She Persisted Global, a cross-national initiative to tackle gender disinformation and online attacks against women in politics, and the author of hashtag She Persisted, Women, Politics, and Power in the New, in the New Media World a study investigating the relationship between women in politics and social media in 30 countries. Uh, we also have Sapria Devetti. She's the Director of Policy and Engagement at McGill Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy. She became personally invested in combating misinformation and disinformation through her experience as the host of a morning show on a Toronto talk radio station. Mis- and disinformation regularly found its way on the airwaves, and it directly contributed to the volume and level of vitriolic threats Supriya herself received. After a particularly vile threat that targeted her daughter, Supriya resigned. Um, we also have Annabelle Ashley Anthony. She's the founder of Melanin Gamers, a gaming community that promotes diversity and inclusivity in the video games industry with a special focus on content creators. Uh, the organization also works to provide a safe space for people of color to come together and game. And last but absolutely not least, we've got Bridget Todd. Bridget's Unbossed Creative's founder and got her start teaching courses on writing and social change at Howard University. Since then, she's a trained human rights activist in Australia, coordinated digital strategies for organizations like Planned Parenthood, the Women's March, MSNBC, and ran a training program for political operatives that the Washington Post called the Democratic Party's Hogwarts for Digital Wizardry. You can hear Bridget on her critically acclaimed podcast, There Are No Girls on the Internet. Thanks again to all of our speakers. Uh, one last comment. If you are joining us live on YouTube or Facebook, we will be taking audience questions towards the end of the session, and you can submit your questions by uh, sending them in through the comments box on the platform you are viewing us from. Uh, and with that, I will pass the floor over to Catherine. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thrilled to be joining you. And our topic uh, that is extremely important, it, it's personal to me. Um, and in particular, I'm very focused on how do we 
combat online hate and violence against women, um, including the links to misinformation and disinformation. And we could not have better speakers. So I'm really excited about these awesome women. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. So the each of the each of the different panelists are going to provide some comments. Uh, then we'll have some moderated questions, and then it's open to you folks. So everyone who's listening, write down your questions. You couldn't have a better group uh, of women who come at this from a variety of different perspectives. Um, so we're going to start with Luciana, um, and I'm very interested um, on what Luciana has to say. So over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm thrilled to be here and also to have the opportunity of having a little conversation with you today. We have looked at the way that while in office you have responded to sexism and you, we have been thrilled and actually have recommended some of your approach and responses to many of the women that we train and work with as they look at providing responses to the attacks that they receive in particular from media and on social media on gender disinformation. I am just um, finishing, finalizing a very long research that I did in the last couple of years that looks in particular at the impact of gender disinformation against women in politics in five different countries around the world. And I think that there have been very interesting takeaways that we will be releasing soon. But I want to give you a preview of really why we believe that this is such a big problem. And hopefully we're going to get into talking about some of the solutions today. Uh, there are five key takeaways of why we believe that really it is essential to tackle gender disinformation if we want to have not only more women in politics globally, but also a better kind of politics. Number one, gender disinformation is pervasive everywhere. Everywhere we go, we see that women in politics are attacked viciously and this is having an incredible impact on their lives and the lives of the families. Stories like the one we heard about women's daughters, very often very young daughters being threatened online with rape and horrible crimes are in fact very, very common. We heard multiple of the women we interviewed from Tunisia to Italy report on that. Um, gender disinformation is an early warning system uh, of two dynamics being at play. On the one hand, the undermining of democratic institutions, and on the other hand, really the backsliding of women's rights. And very often it's being used to attack the very important platforms that women are advocating for. And we see gender disinformation being used in particular to undermine the climate agenda as one of the platforms where we have very strong women leaders at the forefront. Women uh, who come from marginalized sections of society are even more vulnerable and they are targeted even most uh, viciously. And ultimately, social media platforms have failed to protect their users. I know we're going to get into more of the details of what can be done from there, but I wanted to set the stage of some of the findings of our research and where we stand with respect to, to the situation that we are in and who's responsible. Wow, I didn't know I made it into it. It's funny because I was just Googling also your awesome research. So I am very interested in this, especially the solutions um, that, that you recommend, uh, Lucina. Um, all right, so we're going to go on to uh, another one of our panels who I actually do know personally. Um, I have actually, I've been on uh, shows uh, with, with Supriya um, when she was a talk uh, radio host, and actually she really just called it out, which was always <laughs> awesome. She's continued to call it out, but has got a lot of flack for it. Um, and uh, also very vocal on social media. So not backing down, um, actually just calling it out. And uh, I think that's also really important. So Supriya, over to you. Thank you for that, uh, Catherine. Um, so, you know, Warren already touched on this as did Catherine, but I was the host of, uh, a morning show on a Toronto uh, talk radio station. I, I was brought in because the station manager, as well as other members of the executive leadership team uh, for the parent company, said that they were looking to move away from what they described as dashboard pounding radio to smart radio that was focused on informed opinion and analysis. So 
while myself and my co-host at the time, uh, Matt Gurney, were indeed trying to bring that different tone to the station. Um, it didn't seem like the rest of not only our station, but across the radio network um, had any interest in trying to, uh, you know, improve the way things were done. And, you know, as time passed, there was a rather discernible and a predictable pattern that would emerge. The other hosts on the station would allow for either irresponsible commentary or say demonstrably false things on air. And when the morning show wouldn't abide by the same rhetoric, both Matt and I would see a huge uptick in the volume and, uh, and vitriol in our inboxes. But our hate mail was always very different. So as, you know, a white guy, the hate that was directed at Matt was generally reserved for his opinions on an issue, whereas the hate mail that was, you know, thrown my way um, was almost always gendered, um, was almost always racist. And the threats that were included were, were incredibly graphic. And while it's true that even saying something as innocuous as, you know, climate change is real can lead to an uptick in hate mail on talk radio, uh, the really vile stuff was reserved for issues that had to do with racialized or marginalized populations. So uh, the motion to condemn Islamophobia was a very good example. Um, during the debate on the UN Global Compact on Migration is another very good example where there was this huge uptick. And, you know, just to give you a sense of some of the things that were being said on these issues, I mean, you know, the motion to condemn Islamophobia was described on the radio as Sharia law. Um, Trudeau was himself described as an Islamist on the radio, uh, somebody who puts the Islamist cause above all others. Um, I, another thing that would be regularly said is that Trudeau is a known globalist who takes his directives from George Soros. Now, again, you don't have to like the guy. I don't really care. But he's clearly not an Islamist. And M103, which is a motion, was clearly not Sharia law. So all of that to say, I think a lot of the, the disinformation and the misinformation um, that was being said on air was, was basically, you know, flying under the radar. And uh, whereas I had, you know, grown used to my inbox being a bit of a dumpster fire, and as a brown woman, I was used to, you know, threats finding their way in my inbox. Uh, the tipping point was when the threat was no longer about myself or even my husband, but when they uh, targeted my, my then one-year-old daughter. And it was in August of 2020, during the civil protests in the U.S. that followed the, the murder of George Floyd, and somebody had sent me an email that was a rape threat in very graphic terms directed at my daughter, and I was just kind of like, okay, that's it for me. I'm out. Um, it just wasn't worth it for me anymore. Um, and, you know, I now work at the Center for Media Technology and Democracy at McGill University as the Director of Policy and Engagement. And the bulk of my work now is largely focused on responding to the social, political, and policy challenges that are, you know, posed by this uh, evolving information ecosystem that we have, um, as well as the digital technologies. And I I'm specifically focused on the impact of myths and disinformation on our political discourse, as well as trying to engage policymakers from around the world, you know, to come up with online um, governance solutions. And I know, you know, we're going to get into a ton more um, as the panel goes on, but just two really quick points uh, as before I, I pass it back to Catherine, and that's first and foremost, we do need to regulate big tech. It's actually wild that we allow big tech to just unleash all these harms onto society uh, without any sort of oversight or regulatory framework here in Canada. And there are jurisdictions that are getting it right that we can look to. We can look to the EU as well as the UK on this. Um, and we shouldn't only use the states as our, as our main sort of comparator. And then the last thing I will say is that we also really need to get better at talking about the way uh, a lot of our mainstream media also filters down um, some of this myth and disinformation um, to more people. And we can talk about the information pipeline a, a little bit more um, further into the panel, but I just wanted to leave those uh, two thoughts with you. Well, we're very sad, uh, Supriya, that you left. Um, in a way, I was sad, but I'm not in politics anymore, so I wouldn't probably be coming on the show. But you were certainly uh, doing a good job. And so when I would come on, probably I wouldn't have come on otherwise, because at least I could talk in a, you know, science based way about climate. Um, but uh, you're doing obviously really great work. So that's awesome. Okay, so now we are going to go to Annabelle, and Annabelle uh, is going to uh, talk, I think, about online hate and violence in the context of gaming, and we know that that community um, has some particular challenges. Um, so over to you, Annabelle. Thank you. Um, when I guess when we think about hate and um, in the online sphere, it's a lot and it's multifaceted. Um, 
of course it has affect, it affected gaming as well um, because of generally being online of, because of the anonymity. The anonymity of being online means that maybe some things that you wouldn't have said in person in real life, you can say online and get away with. And that's why it's so prevalent in loads of different online spaces, especially gaming. Because a lot of these, some of these multiplayer games, um, you just create an account, you have a name, and then suddenly you can become a different person. And some of these um, spaces are very toxic. There's like, there's five top games that um, that they, they almost cultivate this sort of behavior because they're also not punished for some of the things that they say, which is, um, which is one of the reasons why um, MG, we've started something called The Watch. Um, which is to tackle sort of the toxicity that people face online because gaming for me is very important and I love to game and it's I would say it saved my life I took Saldini and I started gaming because of that and so there's so many benefits of gaming um, but because of the toxicity online a lot of people are leaving certain games um, and with more women getting into gaming because um, I think you guys shared a statistic with since COVID um, there's 51% majority active users who are women or identify as women. And so that's like, we are making up more of gaming. And I think women have always gamed. It's just now because of statistics like that, we can own that, oh, you can call yourself a gamer and not be, I guess, Sean, it's become sort of mainstream and cool. So if you were a gamer, now you can be like, and you didn't actually speak about the fact that you're gaming, you can talk about it vocally. Um, and I think that's had two different effects. It, there's been a lot of pushbacks from, guys um one trying to gatekeep the gaming industry and certain games as well and not calling and saying that certain games that women would like to play are not real gamers and so the attacks on women have been much more because now women are owning the fact that oh i'm a gamer and all this sort of stuff and if you stream or something or you come a voice chat um they'll see that oh that's a woman gaming and then they'll they'll target with your attacks i've had it done to me a lot of times I manage Melanie Gamer's stream team. And from the analytics, the women get worse than the guys do. So I can see the comments of that everyone gets when they stream and the women get it much worse. Um, and so because of that reason, because there's more women gaming, guys have become a bit more aggressive in their sort of endeavor to stop women gaming or gatekeep the gaming industry and say that those aren't real gamers. But then there's been pushback from the women saying, actually, I deserve to be in this space and I'm owning this space. And I would say a few years ago, when I first started gaming online, my brothers told me, don't use, like, use a unisex name. Don't come on the mic. You have to have very thick skin. You have to do all of this sort of stuff. All of these things that we had to do in order to be able to game. Um, now the women who are coming into the game, I don't want to do those things. Why should I need my mic? Why should I have a unisex? Why should I have all of these things? The problem is the bully. So they get rid of them and then we can all game online together. So I think it's creating a different sort of gamer where they won't accept some of these things that we used to accept in the past. They won't accept trolling. They won't accept these things. They're going to come on the mic. They're going to speak to you. And so I think that is also, that 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 is makes me really excited for the future of gaming that some women aren't standing for these things anymore and they're owning these spaces and there are more safe spaces popping up. So I think that despite the many negative things, there are more positives to take away from more women gaming. So this is something that's very close to my heart. Uh, I have three kids, um, two of them particular gamers, and one, uh, my daughter. Uh, we've had many conversations about this. I'm actually proud of my son because he goes and kills people if they say uh, sexist or anything against the LBGTQ plus community. But um, it's obviously a huge issue. We've talked about that for the streamers they watch too. So thank you for doing that because it is really bonkers how bad it is in, in particular. Well, I mean, in all sorts of spaces, but gaming, um, gaming uh, as well. Okay. And so our last but not least panelist, uh, Bridget Todd, um, has an awesome podcast. Uh, well, she has two podcasts, Internet uh, Hate Machine, and there are no girls on the internet. So can't wait to hear what Bridget has to say. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be in community with all of you. Um, so as you just said, I make podcasts specifically about women's experiences on the internet. Internet hate machine and there are no girls on the internet. A question that I get a lot is why is your podcast called There Are No Girls on the Internet? 
Well, there is an old saying, sometimes called Rule 30 of the internet, that everyone on the internet who says they are a woman is just pretending. It's like a guy pretending to be a woman. Or if they are a woman online, that our identities and the issues that are connected to our identities, you know, that they don't really matter because online, we're all the same. The idea that we leave our identities at the door the moment that we log on. But I don't feel like I need to tell you all that that is not true. Our identities do matter online. It turns out they matter quite a bit. And I've spent most of my career making space for Black women on the internet and technology because I know that as Black women, our experiences online are deeply, deeply connected to the health and safety and well-being of our democracy and digital media landscape. Um, we know that Black women are disproportionately impacted by harassment, disinformation, abuse, and hate speech online. Disinformation campaigns that target us are often racialized and gendered, uh, trafficking in racist, gendered stereotypes about Black women. And the research is really clear that what happens in these digital spaces have real world consequences. This is not something that you can stop when you log on. It has a real world impact. When racialized gender disinformation is allowed to fester and thrive online, people become less likely to trust Black women as leaders. Black women are less likely to be civically engaged because even to casually participate in civic discourse means to risk becoming the target of harassment and abuse. And as we know from Supra's experience that she just bravely shared, it's not just going to be the woman who is targeted. It is often their children, their families, their spouses, their mothers. And so women are smart enough to say, I don't want any of that. I'm just going to check out. I'm just going to not be involved. And we really see, as Annabelle noted, that this is really pushing women and other marginalized voices out of these public and civic spaces. Um, our own panelist, Lucina, has been instrumental in understanding the impact that racialized and gender disinformation has on our electoral pol political landscape and democracy. And so I think that given that Black women are the population most directly affected, targeted, and harmed, uh, more, more women who are not connected to the research com community should really have consistent access to this information and be empowered to participate in these conversations, conversations that we're so often left out of. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I make my podcast, to sort of bring these voices that are so important in these conversations into the forefront in these conversations. Um, so if you were online in 2014, you are probably familiar with Gamergate. Um, if you are Lucky enough to have no idea what that is, I'll just give you a, first of all, I envy you, but second of all, just a quick summary. Um, this is where a lot of mostly men were supposedly like big mad about quote unquote ethics and video game journalism. And these men harassed women on the internet and it was awful. And it rightly got a lot of coverage from like the tech press. Uh, but a lot of people, even people who were, you might describe as very online, might not know that it was actually black women who were attacked by these very same people using these very same tactics that we saw in Gamergate years earlier. Only when those women spoke up about it, people with power, you know, people who run platforms, government officials, uh, they pretty much ignored them when they spoke up. I would also be willing to bet that even less people know that these very same kinds of online harassment tactics and deceptive accounts that those women were reporting would go on to be the very same kind of tactics that a 2019 United States Senate inquiry confirmed were used by Russian assets in an attempt to disrupt our 2016 presidential election. So to me, there is a pretty clear through line from ignoring Black women when they speak up about the kinds of abuse and harassment that they face on the internet and you know, pretty important stuff like the security of our elections and democracy. And so, you know, my question that I always ask is, what might have happened if somebody with the power to do something had actually listened to Black women when they reported what was going on years earlier? What if people with power actually listen to Black women when we speak up? Because as true as it is that, you know, marginalized women are the ones being targeted for abuse online, we are also the ones trying to make the internet safer. And when we do, it, that this work is often unpaid, often dangerous, often personally costly, this work of making technology and the internet safer. Uh, and when we do that work, we're doing it at this great cost, not just to make these spaces safer for us, it makes them safer for everybody. Uh, in a piece for Wired called Listening to Black Women, the innovation that tech can't figure out, um, one of my favorite sort of cultural critics and all around online badass, Sidette Harry, argues that when Black women speak up about the abuses and harms that we face online and people with, pow people with power don't listen, that is until that same harm is experienced by others. She writes, 
harmful behavior toward Black women isn't enough to inspire change until others are harmed, but the original harms are often lost by journalists tasked with covering tech. The power and rhetoric that, and that went unchecked becomes common, and the tactics used against Black women for lulls become weapons used in conspiracy theories that destabilize the very nature of truth, from swarming victims to posing as Black women, to destabilizing communities, countries, and democracies. So I believe strongly in the power of listening to women, and I believe that listening to women, particularly marginalized women, can make the internet and technology safer for everyone. Because we know that when abuse and harassment against women happens, even at you know large scale, it often feels like it goes overlooked, and we don't really get the opportunity to really learn from it or take anything away from it. And, you know, as the internet does, everyone just kind of moves on. And I think that making the internet a less hostile space really starts with writing this wrong. It starts by centering and listening to the stories of women who are abused and harassed and harmed online, how it happened, why it happened, and what it means for the rest of us. Uh, because I think that there's this underlying misconception that harassment and abuse is individual. When it happens, people, even people who are sympathetic might think like, gee, what did this person do to, to be getting this kind of harassment? Or, boy, I'm glad I'm not her. But the truth is that it's not about any one person or, or what any one person did. We know that harassment is systemic. It's institutional. And even if we are not the ones on the receiving end of it, it has big implications for all of us. Because these kinds of tactics threaten our democracy. They keep marginalized people from doing things like running for office, or just participating in civic and public life. And they threaten our ability to have a meaningful discourse and to make progress on any number of the very big, very real issues that we know are facing us. Um, so I'm really excited to be in community with all of you digging in on all of this work. Okay, okay, everyone, I hope there's lots of people watching because holy, this is like, these are badass women. Okay, I'm like super psyched because sometimes I felt like I was kind of, it was a bit lonely, but uh, it's really not. And uh, we have super smart women who have really delved into this issue with stats and really understanding it. Okay, maybe we'll just pick up. I, I think probably the best place to pick up is maybe where Bridget left off. Let's just start at the root causes. I mean, we go into the impacts and all that, and we will, um, and why we need to take action, what action we need to take. But what the heck is going on? Um, that we see all this abuse uh, against women. And I, I actually really appreciate your comment, Bridget, because people would be like, you know, you know, it must be something about you. Like some people would suggest like, cause I get all this hate. And I was like, uh, actually it's, it's women that are strong that are working on climate in my particular case, you could extend it to women who are strong online and gaming um, journalists. Um, but let's talk about this. Why is this happening? Um, and uh, I think that, uh, why don't we open this up? Let's have a good discussion. So who wants to take that first? So I can start us off. Um, you know, let me just say that first and foremost, the people like to play up the way in which women are abused online by saying it's just individual bad actors doing individual bad things. And if we get at the heart of these individual bad actors and all of a sudden the online abuse will magically disappear and you know that's just simply not the case i mean people are terrible fine i'll give you that and misogyny exists uh, i will definitely give you that um but we also have to question the way in which our online ecosystems kind of incentivize um the kind of online abuse that women and girls tend to face to begin with and we know from Facebook's own reporting, for example, that they tend to prioritize engagement over anything else. It doesn't matter if that engagement is negative or positive. And so if all you're doing is incentivizing engagement and all you're doing is to try and start, you know, increasing your, your online clout for likes, retweets, shares, whatever it may be, um, you are in effect incentivizing um, the online abuse of all sorts of uh, folks, including women and girls. And, and that's why I think when we're talking about regulating our online spaces, we need to really get at the, the structures and, and the design choices that a lot of these platforms make for the, you know, bad, and I'm putting that in air quotes, but whatever that content may be, however you want to qualify it, um, th for that content to be created and disseminated in the first place. And, and until we get to that 
um, incentive structure, you, we're essentially just playing whack-a-mole with content and we're never going to be able to get to the other side of this. So I think that's a great point. I actually tweeted, if anyone wants to see it, there was a citizens assembly in Canada where I think sometimes governments are like, oh my God, everyone's going to say that uh, we're censoring speech. Yeah. Um, actually, it's not censorship and we can go into a longer discussion but, about that. But it's uh, it's actually the Canadians want to see this action. <laughs> like they are do not like this. Um, and uh, I think we'll get to that later. Anyone else want to weigh in on what the heck's going on? Why is this happening? Why, like gaming, why is it so bad in gaming? Why is it so bad in climate? Are there particular areas beyond like the platforms? Definitely there are serious issues. Sure, I can weigh in there. Um, especially because um, MG started The Watch last year, which we partnered with Leo Burnett um, on launching. Um, which we are specifically targeting Call of Duty in terms of toxicity. That's one of the big five up there that goes along with like... Leo what are the big the five? I'm actually interested. <laughs> I need to know from my kids, but I think I'd just be interested. I mean, I probably... There's there's like loads of games that are quite toxic. Yeah. But Call of Duty is up there, League of Legends, Rust, Overwatch. Those are like online games where they're notorious for like being really, really toxic. And it's just kind of accepted part of gaming that these games are toxic and... If you're going to play, you have to just throw, grow thick skin. And what we're doing is we're holding these gaming companies accountable because some of the reason why people do things is because they're getting away with it. You know, you say something that is triggering to somebody else and your account gets suspended maybe for one day, maybe, and then you're back again tomorrow. So what will tell you to like, oh, this behavior is bad? In real life, if you say something to someone, there's actual real world consequences, but online you can just create another account and be back at it again. And not just that, but if these gaming companies are doing something tangible to stop this, it's almost like their silence is compliance. Like go ahead and keep behaving this way. Um, the amount of hatred that we got when we actually launched the watch, people saying that they liked that this game was toxic and that it felt authentic, that it is toxic. And if you can't handle it, you're a snowflake or you need to grow thick skin, or just mute your mic, or do all of these things, because that is just how the game is, and nothing from the gaming companies about this stuff, so it's like, if they if they don't disagree, then they must agree, that is what, I think, and that's something that we're really pushing forward to last year and this year, saying that these gaming companies actually have to come out and condemn the, this behaviour, because then these people will be like, oh, hold on, wait, the game that we like playing and how we behave, that's not how we're supposed to behave. And I think it's actually really that simple. And implement tools that people can use to report. Um, because um, filing a complaint against someone who's cheating is very easy in the game because obviously that is that costs the game money. But filing a complaint against someone who is being racist, being homophobic, that is much harder to do. And they're not putting the money into those resources because... I don't want to say they don't care, but that is not on the top of the agenda. But actually it should be because some people are stopping playing these games because they're so toxic and they can't handle it. And it's and it's and that's why we created this thing because it's like the community is now coming together to say, look, these games are becoming so toxic, they're becoming unplayable because these companies aren't doing anything. And so because these companies aren't doing anything, it's created a culture of acceptance and then the, the toxicity just grows like a cancer. So I think it's really important that... Um, that they need to start doing something and doing tangible changes and actually calling out this behavior as well. It's totally fascinating. I mean, it is true, no consequences. So you just, you know, you're like, great, I don't really care. I'll continue doing that. Um, okay, so let's go to Bridget. Uh, I know she's got a great point to follow up on Annabelle's great point. Well, Annabelle just made a point that I really want to emphasize that I think that we see as a, a real cyclical cultural problem, this idea that when there's no consequence for bad action, it is not individual behavior. That is actually like a, like a systemic choice to do nothing. And I think she made this point of this idea that, oh, you gotta have thick skin if you're gonna play this game. Like this game is, is really toxic. People are gonna be really awful to you. And I think that that comment is a comment that I hear so often in the stories of folks that I've talked to on my podcast that have experienced online harassment of like, well, what are, you, what are you doing in this gaming community anyway? Why did you run for office? This is just part of being a public figure. If you didn't want to be harassed, if you didn't want your daughter to be threatened, why would you run for office? And I think that when, when people with power don't do anything, it creates that sort of cyclical culture that trains women and all of us 
to expect to not be able to have experiences that don't include harassment or hostility when we show up online. And so it's this real like cyclical problem that, that where the onus, where the machinations that show that it is indeed like an institutional systemic thing and not just a handful of individuals acting badly is obscured. And then the burden is then put on the person who is targeted, right? And so the question then becomes, you know, if you can't, ha if you're a snowflake, why did you play this game? And that's really the sort of systemic cultural problem that I think that we really need to unpack and target. So I think that's uh, I think that's a really excellent point. I remember being in politics and like, you know, people are like, don't call it out because you'll look weak. I was like, I did that for a while. And so I just got angry and angry. And then one day I was just like, sorry. And it was my team. They were great. But I was like, sorry, I'm just going to do it. And I just did it. And then everyone was like, yeah, shit. Why is that? Sorry. This was a swear here probably. But I was, they were like, wait, why are you suffering that abuse? Like, that's not cool. And it actually was good because I think it was a wake up call for many Canadians who are pretty reasonable and didn't like to see this, that this unacceptable behavior is going on. And I think the more you let it go, I don't think you spend every minute of every day calling it out, by the way. I had to like tackle climate change. But it was actually good because it was a wake up call to folks to be like, no, that's not OK. And this is our democracy. And this is ridiculous. It's actually funny because people are like, why do you limit your replies and Twitter to the people you follow? And I was like, that's hilarious. Apparently you miss my time in politics. That's my power now. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand it over, though, because now we have Lucina who's going to talk about uh, particular areas, maybe why they are particularly bad um, in terms of gender, uh, gendered abuse. Thank you so much. And I would definitely agree with your thought and approach in terms of responding to sexism. I think it's really important to call sexism out and the attacks that women in politics are receiving because they are just not politics as usual. I have interviewed hundreds of women in politics by now around the world. And what they're telling me is what they are living right now is not just uh, misogyny as usual. It's not just simply what always happened on the campaign trail. It's at a scale that's very, very different and in many ways much scarier because the online abuse has very, very um, terrible consequences on their lives, on their lives of the families. But I would say just as important on democracy and on younger generation. In many different countries, we hear young women saying, I do not want to enter politics after what I've seen happening to the women leaders that are in politics right now. And so we have a very first generation of young women that have equal opportunities in many ways, being limited in their ambitions and very very often when it comes to the online space, frankly, being limited in their freedom of expression. So going back to the question a little bit of why this happens, I think I entirely agree with what everyone said, and in particular in putting the responsibility on the digital platforms that created tools that work in such a way that misogyny, hate, fake, outrageous content is in fact incentivized and they are making profit out of it over and over again in very many countries around the world and failing to invest in the structures that could prevent it even when they know that harm might happen. And again, the work of whistleblowers has been really important in, in seeing that. Why is this happening? I think that digital platforms, again, would want us to believe that this is just, uh, you know, age old misogyny. In reality, um, this is beyond misogyny. It's a political strategy and it's happening because it works. Over and over around the world, we see women in politics that are leading important actions around climate, around women's rights, around refugee rights, leaving office or being undermined in their effectiveness because of these strategies. So these strategies are being used as a political tool in a very effective one um, by a number of liberal actors, also in government, who silence opposition, under and undermine important agendas of the world. Um, and, and, you know, I just want to say an example. Um, you wrote about last year ahead of the German elections for Chancellor. Alina Barber, a Green Party candidate at that 
time was actually running and she was ahead in the elections. Uh, she started receiving a number of online attacks, including um, a nude photo of a different woman and with the claim it was in fact her. That photo circulated online hundreds of times and in very few months she ended up losing very many points and, and arriving third in the general elections. It was found out that uh, an overwhelming number of attacks that were happening online against her and spreading uh, conspiratory uh, theories around her and fake information were coming from Russia. So knowing what we know now, it was particularly important for Russia, clearly, to make sure that whoever was going to be challenged was not someone that was very strong on uh, energy and um, not being reliant on Russia for energy, knowing, as we know now, that Russia at that time was already planning for the invasion of Ukraine. So again, I think it's really, it's really important to understand that this is a political strategy, that this has uh, global implications, national security implications that go well beyond the acceptable of what uh, every woman and her politics should, should, be, should be thinking, should be facing. So this is really great. I love our discussion and I love the fact that we're getting some questions. So if you are listening, feel free uh, to ask some questions. You can write them in the chat. Um, okay, so we got a question. Uh, there's evidence that a, there's a very small number of accounts on Twitter, for example, maybe applies to, to Facebook and others that spew and maybe probably gaming too, that spew a disproportionately large amount of hate. Do you have any recommendations for addressing that. And I think that's good. Let's get into like, okay, what the heck are we going to do about all this? It's bad. We know it's terrible. Um, but what can we do? So who wants to talk about, is it true that it's a very small number of accounts? Um, and if it's true, what should we do? Now we did hear that, you know, you, the, you can have consequences, including in the gaming world, but who wants to take this on? Well, I can give two like concrete examples. I, I can't speak to whether or not this is true sort of writ large, but I can give you two examples that I think are pretty clarifying. One is that I just learned recently from doing an episode of the podcast that I think it was 86 Twitter accounts were responsible for over 70% of harassment of Meghan Markle. And two, that there was a time where the majority of COVID misinformation on Twitter was being spewed by just 12 accounts. And so the fact that a, like this such small number of accounts is able to have such an outside impact on the discourse and misinformation and harassment, and yet platforms still sort of drag their feet of being like, well, if it's just these 12 people, like, is this really the kind of people that you wanna empower on your platform? But it really goes to show how broken our platforms are and our digital ecosystem is that a handful of people have figured out that they can effectively gamify our largest digital communications platforms to say things that are not true, to harass, to spread conspiracy theories and lies and abuse. And platforms just accept it and don't and, and are still so slow to act when acting would really be like cracking down on a handful of accounts. And so that research, I don't I again I can't say if it's sort of true writ large, but from my, from what I have found, it is definitely true that it is less people than you think who are responsible for this kind of behavior. And I think that those, that small handful of accounts can have a, have a, a an impact on people who are just interested in like legitimate, meaningful discourse. If you show up to Twitter and you're just interested in talking about Meghan Markle or some other topic, and you have come to see that the entire internet is spewing conspiracy theories about this one topic or this one person, it's certainly going to impact how you show up as somebody who's just interested in you know, having a thoughtful, accurate, fact-based conversation. And so I definitely think that, that that idea, that stat, really shows how broken our digital communications platforms really are. Can, can I just add to that really quickly um, in terms sure. of what, what Bridget oh. said? Because um, I mentioned that, you know, needing to, to regulate big tech and we know that the you know federal government here in Canada is likely going to be tabling something, you know, within the next couple of months. And an aspect that absolutely needs to be included in whatever that, you know, regulatory framework looks like 
is uh, intermediary liability protections uh, and, and then exemptions also for platform liability. So what I mean by that is, uh, first and foremost, Canada is the only G7 country without comprehensive intermediary liability laws in place. So uh, when the federal government does introduce legislation, they should be incorporating that li those liability protections that you know are consistent with whatever trade obligations we have, particularly under you know NAFTA 2.0 or CUSMA, USCMA, whatever we call it. Um, and that legislation would then actually clarify when platforms can and can't be held liable for harms that arise from the content that are posted uh, on them. And, you know, I, I bet we'd see pretty quickly um, in, in the question uh, from the questioner there that if there's just a small handful of accounts on Twitter that are the ones that are spewing the hate, uh, they'd be deplatformed if uh, Twitter was going to be responsible for the content that they posted. Um, and so we really do need to incentivize action because as of right now, we are seeing that the, the, there is, well, if there is action, it's incredibly inconsistent. Um, and even at that, the action that does exist um, doesn't really actually remedy the harm that's occurred. So, I mean, this is really great. I mean, I think there's probably, we're going to run out of time because there's so many angles to this, but we also know that these platforms use algorithms to amplify hate. Um, and then there's like some folks that are have huge followings. So they might be one person, but if they have huge followings, uh, we've seen this on disinformation, gendered abuse, uh, abuse against um, the LGBTQ2 plus community against minorities. Um, that's a real problem because they reach a lot of folks. Um, and this targeting is, is you know, bonkers. I, my kids, you know, they're obviously on YouTube and they get very weird things. Um, targeting them uh, and they don't even that's not even something that they would normally they're like I don't know why they're targeting me on this because I don't this is like totally against what I believe in so um, but I think there's a really interesting question that we got so we see women's uh, we see around the globe so many attacks on women's rights that can be state-based attacks that can be um, political type of attacks um, human rights attacks do you see a connection between these attacks and larger movements that it's actually something bigger? Like, of course, there, uh, you know, there's systemic issues. There are individual, particular individuals. But is there something bigger going on? Or how is it related or coordinated? We personally... I mean, we personally definitely see almost a playbook uh, being used with some of the same narratives uh, going on around women in politics and being used to undermine them uh, across different countries. And that's why we wanted to do a study that looked at countries as diverse as Italy, Tunisia, Brazil, India and Hungary, so that we could see really what is going on at the world level and that tax against women's rights and the women that are at the forefront of the feminist movements and women's rights movements also be the most attacked in these countries and also women. You know, I think we're having problems with your internet. Is that possible? I, I'm having problems hearing you. Anyone else? Yeah, same. Can you hear me? Um, it's not me. I'm like, is it me or is it you? <laughs> but yeah, maybe try again. We're just, I think the connection is a bit bad. Oh, no. I think you're now frozen. All right. Christina, Sorry about that. We might then no with someone else. Okay, we might come back to you. Does anyone else want to weigh in? Sorry on? about that. Let's Are you hearing on. me? Oh, yeah, that's great. We can hear you. Go ahead. Maybe, maybe we can hear you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna send you a message just in case you don't know that. Uh, okay, so anyone else want to weigh in about this global issue? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just pick up where she sort of left off, which is that uh, I don't think we can deny that there's uh, a connection between the two. Um, I think if one were to vehemently suggest that they're completely disconnected is to kind of stick your head in the sand and uh, not looking at the evidence that's uh, presented right right towards you. And in, in terms of, you know, what, what Lucina said there about a, a playbook, I, I think that's that's very much right. Um, and, and, and we heard that in uh, Bridget's opening comments too about Gamergate, right? When you look at uh, that basically sets the playbook and that playbook has been followed since. And for whatever reason, uh, we're not um, acting on it. And we, in terms of talking about it, uh, you know, tech circles maybe talk about Gamergate and its influence on, on harassment and targeted harassment more generally. 
Um, but that's certainly not what I talk about when I'm on political panels on television or when we're talking about, um, you know, the leader of the official opposition using a hidden uh, incel adjacent misogynistic tag on the last four years of his YouTube uploads before he was caught, right? Like these are, they just, it's like these conversations are happening in, in two different silos and we need to sort of meld them together to come up with proper solutions and to actually recognize the problem because otherwise we're just essentially gaslighting all women and girls um, by telling them that they're a uh, disconnected phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think about this a lot and I think it's easier to amplify, like to get political support for misogyny because of these platforms and how you can reach, uh, you can specifically target people, but use misinformation, disinformation, which obviously is extremely worried and sometimes that's that's state driven. Um, okay, so we have another really good question here. Um, are online platforms being used to lure girls and women? Should we have age verification measures or maybe other measures? I know Instagram has certain measures um, to uh, address this. I don't know. It's quite specific. So anyone? Yeah, I, I would love to weigh in. I mean, I the reason why I do what I do is in part because I it was internet experiences that that were so transformative in my own life. Like, you know, I, I'm old. I'm an oldie, you know, and so like, I remember the days when logging on felt like freedom, it felt like exploration, it felt like, you know, the ability to really explore who you were. And I feel like what we're seeing right now is the way that our platforms and our internet experiences are no longer like a safe place to explore who you are for the younger generation. Now it feels like a commercialized marketplace for their pain. And so I absolutely do think that we are desensitizing a, a, a whole new generation of women and girls uh, to experience to think of their online experiences as places where they will only, you know, find hostility and pain. I think that Frances Haugen as a whistleblower really showed us some of the ways that Facebook isn't just doing this knowingly, they are making money from it. And so I think that we really have to ask, are we okay with a tech billionaire adding to his bottom line by making our children, you know, giving our children mental health crises, which we know they are. And so I absolutely agree that like, we need to be talking about the impact on young women and girls in particular and asking some hard questions about do we want to continue sacrificing our young women and girls online experiences so that Mark Zuckerberg can get an extra comma in his bank account. Ooh, I like it. Happy <laughs> birthday, feisty. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about any other ideas about how we're going to deal with this. So we have talked about like individual consequence consequences. We've talked about holding social media companies in to account. I mean, more maybe there's broader things that we should be thinking about because it is obviously hugely a uh, huge problem for women and girls, but it's also, um, and I think it was Luciana, so I don't know if she can weigh in, um, but it's also a problem with democracy. I um, mean, I've always said to people, like when, you know, you have attacks on climate and climate disinformation, often gendered, um, you also see it's kind of the same people who are, you know, attacking democracy because you're not, you're not going to get climate action if you don't, you know, if you don't have democracy. So what, what do we think? What other things do we need to be doing? Like, is there, I, you know, you can talk about uh, countries, I think it's Sweden or you know, Scandinavian countries seem to be ahead where they're trying to educate the public, like educate young people in schools to recognize that this is unacceptable, that there's misinformation, disinformation. Do we need to be doing more to educate young people, for example, or anyone, I guess? Yeah, I, I can weigh in there. I think um, definitely education is a very important part of things. Um, at Mellingham, as we go into a lot of schools and colleges and we do different workshops about staying safe online and that sort of thing, especially now more than ever and how people can protect themselves online. We do want um, people to have like the freedom of line. And that, that's how I felt when I first was like on the internet. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. But there are yeah. things that we need to do to protect ourselves and to protect children when they're going online. And maybe they're a bit naive as to like who they, who they might be talking to and safe spaces and create creation of safe spaces. So when we go into like the different schools that we do, we sometimes work with children who are as young as 10. So they will have a separate discord that everyone in that discord will be around eight to 10 years old. And all of them are there are verified they're that age and the school moderates it so that they know that their children are only talking to other children. I think 
arming them with knowledge so that they know how to navigate the online sphere is better than just ignoring it or saying no don't go online because that's just leaves them open to attacks or falling for someone who might be a predator online rather than teaching them that this is how the world is and then you know shaping it and changing it and I think that is how we move forward with these things and protect women who go online and like don't know how to like navigate these things because what the information I was given by my brothers it was helpful but it's not how I want to be moving forward where it's just like I have to do so many things because online is so bad I think we need to be educating and also changing certain policies and holding I can't say this enough about holding some of these companies accountable for some of their actions because it's up they can make the biggest changes you know I believe obviously we are grassroots um, organization I believe in like bottom up but there's also the top down approach where they can make certain policies and changes very quickly and things will change around and um, that we've seen in certain games when they when they're getting it right so some games are actually getting it right where they will be quick to respond to things. They, they're implementing things so that people don't get harassed or the harassment is far less. So the experience online is nicer. So if those companies are getting it right, what's to stop your company from not doing the same thing that they are? So I think those are two different things that we need to be um, addressing really carefully in schools as well. I couldn't agree more. And I, I worry because I think we do need to, to figure out how we educate the population more broadly about disinformation. But also, like, I do worry, honestly, about boys. Uh, and we've talked about this in my house. I mean, Andrew Tate, I was like, what? I didn't even really know anything about this, this guy who's like a criminal. But um, that, that there is a, a active targeting of, of young boys um, and younger men. So clearly major issues there. Anyone else, uh, anyone else wanting to weigh in because we are coming to the very end. How about something positive? Let's see who has something positive. I mean, I think the most positive thing I can say is you guys are awesome women who are doing awesome things. Together in person. Oh. I don't know. Is that Lucian? Okay. You know what? Maybe we're actually going to run out of time. So why don't I um, pass this over? I believe if I'm not wrong, sometimes I'm wrong in things, but we're almost out of time. And I think it's now over to Lauren, uh, who helped organize this at Megs. Thanks so much. Um, a huge thank you to Sapria, Annabelle, Bridget, Lucina, and Catherine. I think I speak for our whole audience when I say we learned a lot in this uh, very brief one-hour session, and we could have stayed on a whole lot longer. Um, thanks again to the National Council of Women of Canada for their partnership and for the Department of Canadian Heritage for funding the Digital Peace Project. Please stay tuned for more events in the series. We've got five in total. Thanks. <laughs>